Ja, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second edition of our lecture series, Making Sense of the Digital Society, Using Digital Society Well. The Federal Agency for Civic Education works together with the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society on the, these lectures. We started in December. Manuel Castells was our first guest. We will keep on having more conferences throughout the year. Every six to eight weeks, we will have hopefully very exciting um, presentations here. This series was inspired by the diverse and ambivalent um, aspects of digital progress and that we need to keep in mind permanently, whether it's in private life, in uh, our work life um, or elsewhere. And they keep challenging us. This is due to the fact that the technological development keeps increasing and we couldn't imagine this speed um, a few years ago. Due to the digitalization, we see an enormous potential for um, communication, for production and for participation and they keep revolutionizing these aspects. However, it is especially due to these elements that there are um, risks that we had not expected before for our societies because there are a few globally acting and quite intransparent players, internet companies, which dominate these markets. Big data has enormous potential for surveillance, but also for the mani manipulation of human behavior. And additionally, we see the, um, the anonymous behavior in the digital sphere, which gives a certain protection, but many people also abuse this. Therefore, we see over and over again that there are racist and inhuman um, declarations and statements online, such as hate speech, fake news and others. Of course, all these tendencies are not new. We've seen them for several years now. However, they have reached a dimension which, as far as we are concerned, makes, make it necessary to start a debate on digital participation and the legal um, design of the um, online uh, sphere. And this needs to be um, discussed with a much broader audience. Therefore, we are delighted that so many of you have come here today for this second uh, lecture. We decided to um, discuss these enormous changes that have to do with um, digitalization and we want to use a European perspective for this. That means that for the coming months we will invite leading intellectuals from Germany and from uh, other European countries. They um, will present leading ideas, leading visions for how to shape our digital society. We invite them in order to tell us about their um, areas of expertise and to explain digital change for us. They will also show us the um, very complex present and also future. On that note, I would like to end my little speech. We are not here for my introductory words, but you have come here in order to hear our guest speak. It is Professor Dr. Christoph Neuberger from the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. We are absolutely looking forward to hearing him speech. He will talk about democracy and public sphere in the digital society. I wish all of us an inspiring and insightful evening. I would now like to give the floor to our host, to um, the very much appreciated journalist Tobi Müller, who will introduce and present our speaker a bit more. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Melina, from the Federal Agency for Civic Education for your introductory words. There's hardly anything that I can add. We've already said that you are not here to listen to us, but to our guest. However, I would like to um, find a bit of additional information. You know um, the most important words. It's not only in the US, but also in Germany. For instance, the lying press, that this word came up here in Germany. Hate speech also is an important uh, word here. In my home country, in Switzerland, on the 3rd of March, we will vote on if the uh, um, SED will be um, abolished and if the um, fees that must be paid by everyone will be abolished as well. This will basically be the end of the pu um, public broadcasters of, um, in uh, Switzerland. We know that these trends exist, however, what we do not know yet, and um, which is our um, question today, who um, talks to us today and what are the norms that uh, we have nowadays for media? How can we discuss Describe this. How can they be described by um, by by research by scientists? These are these are phenomena that um, are happening very very quickly. And how can we describe them better? I think that this is something that we will learn about tonight by our guest. Welcome to Making Sense of the Digital Society. We also have a hashtag for tonight, which is Digital Society. You can use this hashtag in order to ask questions or make comments. After um, this presentation after the about 30 minute uh, discussion that I will have with our guest, you can participate because we can hardly talk about the internet without having you participate in it. Of course, this is a major part of this when talking about um, old media, old mediums and how we, um, we change them. Of course, we are also streaming. Um, and you can see this um, on alex-berlin.de, which is a local um, broadcaster here in Berlin. And you can also watch the stream online. You can watch this on bpb.de, the uh, federal agency's um, website, and also um, on the website of the Institute for Internet and Society. You might know this standard situation when talking about media and criticism. Since there have been media and uh, mediums, um, there have been two sides. You could, might even call it bipolar, because there are the optimists and the pessimists. Some say, oh, we don't know what's going to happen. We've reached the end of civilization. And then there are those who um, see the new messiahs in this new medium. Our speaker tonight is so very well known because he's neither one of the optimists nor one of the pessimists. He has um, stayed calm and reached an opinion on this. He is considered a visionary in his field, especially in Germany, because sooner than others, he realized that the old media um, not old descriptions of democracy and um, public sphere are not enough for what we are currently experiencing. Around one year ago, in December 2016, he received the Schelling Prize from the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities. In 2011, until 2011, he um, gave lectures in Münster. Afterwards, he started working at the LMU University in Munich and is the head of the um, uh, Department of Communication Sciences. He has a very broad title for his presentation, which we do not often see in, these, in this kind of field. We are glad that he has chosen it. It is called Democracy in Public Sphere in the Digital Society. Afterwards, we'll have our talk, and then you can participate. However, I'm glad that he has come here safe and sound and just in time from Munich. Welcome, Professor Christoph Neuberger. Yeah, best 
Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to speak here in front of you today. Um, Mr. Müller already mentioned it. I will talk about a topic that can um, be quite, uh, quite astonishing, because um, today we are talking about the whole. We try to take a broad perspective on society, and that is necessary, but is also a major challenge. Usually we try to focus on details. We look at um, what's, uh, what's happening in the news. We look um, at very detailed research questions. And hardly ever we have to look at um, the, the big picture. That's what I um, try today. Of course, it's not enough to present it in all its facets within 45 minutes. Therefore, I will focus on certain main theses. I try to do it as structured as possible, and afterwards we'll have the opportunity to um, clarify certain questions or go more into depth in certain areas. My presentation is made up of four um, parts. First, I would like to start with a description. I would like to ask what is new about this digital society. This, by the way, is the society that is marked by digitalization, and I will especially focus on the Internet. Therefore, I will basically start with the phenomenon itself and try to work out what is the contrast between what we have um, described as a digital society since the 1990s and today. Then I will go back a bit and take a look at what my perspective is. I speak as a communication scientist here, but this is only one of many perspectives. Of course, we have plenty of uh, discourse universes that could take a look at the digital society, and all of them have their own logic. It is quite difficult to leave your own bubble in this case. However, we need to connect these different universes better. But first, I would like to describe my perspective on the Internet as a communication scientist. Afterwards, I would like to evaluate. Does the, does the digital society receive from Internet what it expects? This is the part where I will ask exactly this question and uh, also ask how you could develop a certain um, evaluation um, a benchmark it. And in the last part of my presentation, I will talk about the design. We will um, resume what, where we have reached and how we can shape Internet better. However, first we need to understand how it works. We need to be able to explain how this um, network audience works. Here we need science, we need theories that can explain us how this um, interaction dynamics work before we can think about how to improve the Internet. So that was a brief overview of what I would like to talk about and I hope I will be able to keep it within 45 minutes. So first let's talk about the um, characteristics of the Internet. I wondered what is special about it. In digital society, what is different from, from what we have um, experienced earlier in the analog society. First, we need to talk, talk about um, the scope of the fracture. Is everything new or do some things also remain the same? Is it um, justified to talk about a revolution? Do we see these enormous changes? Is the comparison to Johannes Gutenberg and the invention of um, the letterpress really um, right, or do we do we overestimate what is happening? We usually tend to making things bigger than they are. We will probably not reach a final conclusion here, but maybe we can talk about this at the end again, because there certainly are certain um, factors that show us that um, things are changing enormously. 
Pierre Bourdieu wrote an essay about television. In this essay, he described two groups of persons dealing with modern media. On the one hand, we have the visionaries, the optimists. They, have, um, they are of the opinion that everything changes. And then there is the other group. These people think that everything remains the same and nothing has changed. We have our own biographic experience and therefore know that whenever we are dealing with new digitalization, there are certain effects happening. When working with a new mobile phone, when seeing the Internet for the first time, for instance. I would now um, like to um, talk about the uh, a book by Thomas Mann, which takes place at the beginning of the 20th century. He describes the gramophone here. I would now like to quote a part of this book. Mann describes the gramophone as a um, wonderful technological object which allowed one to listen to music just as though an artist were playing right in front of him. So there's this effect of astonishment when being um, confronted with a new medium. But this experience passes very quickly. The more often we have these um, new contacts with new media, the quicker it passes. And this is the case in um, in our presence today. For a long time, media developed very slowly. There were new media, they um, needed to become a part of what was already existent. In 1605, there was the first newspaper. In 1923, the first um, broadcaster um, on radio. And in 1935, the first television television channel. With digitalization, we now see a constant uh, change and innovation. Hermann Lübbe, a philosopher, described it as the um, shrinking of our presence. With reference to Koselek, he says that presence is a um, time frame in which we see um, stability, because what we know and what happens basically is the same. Our experiences help us to um, cope with the presence and with what is the near future. However, in our modern times, this has changed. Our experience and our expectations do not match anymore. This becomes dangerous when the um, speed is so fast that we need to keep on making new experiences and gain new knowledge constantly. This is um, the situation of the so-called liquid presence. The Internet definitely supports this development of um, our society. And this then leads to a certain limitation, as described by Niklas Luhmann. This means that we do not have time anymore to lean back and think about it, because we are currently exposed to a new technologies. And this is what is meant with the shrinking of the presence. So until now, I've only talked about the scope of the fracture and how uh, quick it happens. Now I would like to ask, what is special about the Internet? As we have learned, it is difficult to describe media. They should always be differentiated in two aspects. On the one hand, we see the technology and knowledge about technology that you need to have. When taking a look at this technology, the Internet is an incredible medium. Some people say it's not even a medium, it's a technological infrastructure. And it's not comparable to anything we have um, experienced so far. 
It's not um, a machine with uh, buttons, it's not paper, um, it's different. Peter Glaser, an Austrian author, um, once said that the most difficult thing about the Internet is to imagine it, because we have no clear picture. When it comes to cyberspace um, um, and other um, areas, these don't help us in um, understanding and grasping the Internet either. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, the Internet can do everything. Convergence. The Internet gives us more than any of the other mediums separately. It can be used um, in all kinds of fields. I would now only like to name a few. The participation is um, very broad. Everyone can participate. There's not only this uh, one-way street anymore of the medium towards the audience, but the audience can respond. Now there are more ways of participation and there are longer chains of interactions as well. Furthermore, there are new possibilities of connections and of networks. So far, we had um, the um, newspaper that was in between information, the information source and the audience, and now there's a direct way. Furthermore, we see in many areas that there's a lot of transpa transparency. This is usually automated with the help of um, algorithms that can show us personalized information. The Internet offers us any kind of um, information source and medium. We see an automization of data as well. And there are lots and lots of, of other things that I cannot mention all. The um, time and space um, dimension also shows new opportunities. Um, we can storage information. We have um, a better access to this information because we have our mobile phones, our laptops with us all the time. So this is what I describe as the intangibility of the technology and the Internet as an all-rounder. But that is only one aspect of it. The second aspect is as to how we should deal with this technology. Um, how do we shape the Internet? So is everything open for everybody? The speciality of the Internet is that on the one hand, uh, technologically, it is shapeable. You can do a lot with it. The second point is that in it, all of a sudden, everybody can participate. With the traditional mass media, it was usually just a small editorial office, uh, uh, some publishers, uh, some journalists. So that was the circle of people who told people what to do with this media. In the internet, with the social media, everyone can participate. On the one hand, because of the huge number number of participants, this means that there is a lot of need of coordination of who shall participate, but the possibility of opting in also takes place on platforms which are provided by certain internet companies, Facebook, Twitter, etc. So we have a broader participation, involvement, but on the other hand, this is again concentrated in the hands of a few operators. So in any case, we are dealing with a medium that can be shaped, that everybody can uh, switch into. Uh, that's why it's so difficult to make uh, very general statements, because it's very easy to uh, find other uh, opinions on it. Mrs. Kasek said it in the following way, referring to Twitter, the quality of Twitter is um, difficult to generalize um, just as little as you can generalize on the quality of a bookshelf. Uh, Twitter is as good as uh, the number of its users. There is no shared uh, basis. Those who join Twitter joined, it, joined Twitter because they wanted to. This is a good description of this intangibility of the Internet. 
uh, to describe it as a paradox. It's a finality of this uh, temporariness. That's what so special is, and it is very heterogeneous. Another characteristic that I'd like to only briefly touch upon is the expansive force in this digitized world. In the 1990s, we still thought that we had two worlds. On the one hand, the real world and cyberspace on the other hand. Uh, a cyberspace, a virtual world with different rules, an anonymous world uh, where you can play with virtual identities uh, without context and without any consequences or impact on the real life. Uh, today, uh, this notion has changed, I think. Uh, when we noticed that on StudiVZ and other um, media like Facebook, it was uh, realized that uh, you only transfer the real context that you have in your real world, that you do not necessarily create new contact. So activities you used to do in the online, in the offline world, are now transferred to the online world. And, uh, the Internet of Things uh, will further merge the two worlds. I talked about characteristics. Uh, I tried to describe how the digital world uh, differs from what we knew in the past. I would now like to look at the consequences of this. Uh, first, we need to talk about uh, the context collapse, the uh, dissolution of borders and the crossovers, because everyone can participate and because the Internet is indeed shapeable and has such a huge, huge potential and because there are no borders, the former institutional order is dissolving. So um, there, it has an, a weakness of as an institution. Uh, you can see that positively, but on the other hand, uh, dividing lines and context are important for a better understanding. It, they provide orientation to the people. In the past, uh, we had a well-structured media world with clear boundaries. Uh, uh, you knew your brand, you knew your newspaper, uh, the way the layout works, etc. In many places, as we now see this uh, uh, erosion of boundaries. We looked at it in a study on journalism only recently, this erosion of uh, boundaries between professionals and amateurs. We have lay journalists who think that they can do journalistic work. Uh, with boundary obviously disappearing. Uh, we have other phenomena that are exacerbated by the internet. Uh, sometimes you do not know whether uh, the producers of text in the internet, uh, whether they are advertising something or are they only promoting themselves. The, their role and their identity is often not clear. So we are dealing with crossovers who do not have a clear clear media identity. But there are other areas as well where we can identify uh, such uh, absorb dissolution of boundaries. Uh, if we look at newspapers, radio, TV, uh, in contrast to the internet, we tried to sort of um, uh, separate them. But now we are confronted with a, a cross-media phenomenon and also the way we look at um, mass media is something that we need to think about. YouTube, for example, well, what is mass communication? And we have a smaller and a bigger audience at times. There are new boundaries between the public sphere and the private sphere. What is the public interest and the private interest? Um, topicality and storing of information. Uh, we have a mixture of uh, facts and, fi and, and fiction. Uh, I don't, don't, don't want to try a, a bleak picture, but I think we have to 
notice that uh, we see the erosion of previous boundaries as we knew them in the past. And of course, in the past, we also trusted that these boundaries were respected. My next point is the return of the masses, collective phenomena in, on the internet. The so-called mass media, uh, the newspapers and radio never really reached the masses in a traditional sense, like uh, masses were described during the French Revolution. Uh, mass is now described as a crowd of people in one room. Mass only knows a dispersive audience where the individual stays by him or herself. But this big mass that is controllable and accountable is not something that was reached by the traditional mass media. And uh, every study only focused on the impact of the social called mass media on the individual. What we are faced with today are interactive collective phenomena. We have a new dynamic because a lot of people work together. We have uh, chain reactions. We have an escalation of events. Uh, and very often it's difficult to identify who triggered what in these viral effects. Uh, often the impact is difficult to trace. And we have have a high degree of complexity that challenges us to develop new methods and new uh, theories. And this is what I would like to conclude with. The mass is something that we sort of lost sight of. In the late 18th and 19th century, we had uh, revolutions, the shocks of the French revolutions to the powerful uh, who had to realize that the masses can uh, bring everything out of control. Um, what we saw in the cities, we had the uh, formation of big groups of people who uh, act together and with each other. All this has been described with uh, in mass psychology, for example, by Gustave Le Bon. Of course, uh, from a different perspective, he talked about the incited masses who responded to something. We also see a lot of mass phenomena on the internet, but I think today we have a differenti more differentiated view of the wisdom of the masses. And also when you look at Wikipedia, for example, a lot of people uh, join together and try to bring something fruitful and something enriching to the others. The question is, how do we deal with it? Let me now turn to the last point of this uh, part of my presentation. What are the consequences? The perfect technology and the urgency of the essential questions. We talked about multi-modality, um, we talked about uh, the shapeability of a media. The more perfect the technology, the less important it becomes. The less of an obstacle the technology is, the less we need to look at its actual use. Marshall Lunds said it's not about the message, but it's the media that characterizes the message. Manuel Castells wrote that uh, the message in this new system is indeed the characteristic. Now, what does that mean? Chris Anderson, the former chief editor, Weinchef, said it's not about, no longer about what the distribution channels want. And we come back to the essential question, what do we want to achieve with this new, almost boundless technology? Already in 1995, an essay in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, we could read about the dissolution of the boundaries and 
There it was said that this uh, new technologies relieves us of many burdens in everyday life. Uh, we have the emergence of a normative intelligence, which is an intelligence that helps us to find out what we want and what is good for ourselves and for the others. This essential question can be asked again when uh, such a new media emerges all of a sudden, as it was the case with the internet. It sort of emerged almost out of the blue. Bertolt Brecht described a similar experience in the 1920s when uh, the first uh, radio broadcasts were started. And he said, our society allows us to make uh, innovations, inventions that uh, still have to find their market. You had the possibility to tell everything to everybody, but you could also choose not to say anything. And he then said that the radio basically um, took on the role of a, a proxy, uh, that it would only do what others had done before in real life. And he said that radio would have to find its own uh, justification for existence. The internet is a very similar case. Uh, it has hardly any limits other than the radio, which now takes us to the question as to what we expect from the internet as a society. But let me, in between, briefly touch upon another topic and look at something uh, or look at the way I look at these topics as a communication scientist. I think it's important to state that how we talk about the new media, um, the new media that are still emerging, they are produced, they are be still being produced. It's what Mr. Gieses described as a communication process. But there are different perspectives that follow their own logic. We have a journalistic, a legal, a political discourse, a scientific and academic discourse that is again subdivided into different expert debates. Some sometimes competing with each other, often not really communicating with each other. And if you look at your own field of expertise, uh, you often ha have feel the need that you want to break out of this bubble. But the great and dominant public debate on the internet is often driven by spectacular individual incidents, um, topics described by the visionaries in Silicon Valley, where the scientific expertise often falls behind. The question is, how we can provide better accessibility. I think this is a big question, not because I would like to focus on the academia or my expert field in particular. Uh, scientific logic may have its disadvantages. We are usually very slow. We are slow to respond. We, what we present is often not very gripping difficult to understand, but we see on the internet that only too often uh, theses are taken for granted without being checked or verified, and this results also in a kind of uh, loss of trust in journalism that many people uh, speak about, even though there is no real evidence for that. There are a number of surveys that have looked into this topic and my colleagues from Munich also looked into it, and there is no real evidence of this loss of trust that many people speak about. So maybe if you just keep on talking about it, people will eventually believe it. 
Another example, echo chambers, filter bubble, that seems to be a fact, that's the way it is presented. People who try to uh, substantiate that empirically uh, have a very hard job. There may be uh, certain tendencies. People like to uh, get in touch with each other. They connect more easily, but we cannot really talk about a disintegration of the public sphere or the general audience. It is usually the big mass media that still sort of um, provide this link between the different audiences. Um, it would be difficult to explain such phenomena like the uh, hate comments without uh, stipulating that they leave their filter bubble from time to time. Let me now continue with the third part of my talk. And I'd like to focus on that a little bit longer. The question is, does the digital society get from the internet what it expects? So I'll try to sort of position ourselves and taking stock after 20 years. If we were to talk about uh, profit or losses, gains or losses, uh, where are the opportunities and where are the risks of the Internet? First question uh, we need to ask is what is the benchmark against which we try to assess it? The society as such cannot wish for something. Uh, they can only choose a proxy or a representative who would then say that the one or the other is desirable. So the question is, how can we develop good benchmarks? There are uh, theories, normative theories of the public sphere that describes uh, how this works. There are participatory and other approaches. We often talk about the public value that is discussed, particularly in connection with the public broadcasters, the uh, mandate that they have. Uh, it is clearly the mandate clearly um, describes what their purpose is. I would like to refer to a catalog of values which I consider to be a synthesis of all normative deliberations of uh, free and democratic values that can be described. And it's important to also use them as the benchmark, so to speak, for the empirical research and sort of tick them off whether they are met or not. I don't want to talk about the justification of the individual values and uh, uh, the weighing of them. But the question is, what have we achieved? I'd like to present to you five, uh, eight values, and I'd like to try to position ourselves where we are today. If you look at literature, then there is always an optimistic and a pessimistic view on these respective values, and the question is, what dominates? First question, um, freedom. Did the Internet give us more freedom? John Perry Barlow said in the mid-1990s that there is a declaration of independence of the cyberspace. He declared it as a free space where um, governments or companies should not have an influence on. He thought this would be impossible anyway. Um, we had to bid farewell to this idea because this we know now that this is no longer the case. Uh, the NSA scandal showed us this very clearly. Uh, Mr. Mogonov said that the internet is a very powerful tool of suppressing 
suppression. Freedom House that uh, tries to measure the freedom on the internet recently said in 2017 that in only 16 out of 65 countries the internet can be called free. The second value I would like to discuss is that of equality. Again, huge expectations um, to the internet and at first glance uh, uh, the internet seems to comply. The idea that those who so far did not have such a good access to the internet, uh, that the underprivileged now have better opportunities because the internet is provided for free, um, it is uh, easily accessible, and this question of equality or inequality has always two sides to it. It has this, this side and the communicative side, so who can actually actually join into a public debate and form public opinion. When we talk about digital division, there are quite a number of uh, empirical studies. So the technical access to the internet, that is the question that has been answered. 90% um, of uh, people uh, under 14 years of age, use the internet on a daily basis. What we focus on more now today is the question of how is the internet used? Who seeks political information on the internet? Who uses the opportunities to um, speak out publicly and try to form public opinion? But we also know from studies that uh, there are um, divisions in the participation. It is not enough uh, to just uh, utter your views. And there has been a study on it with the result that uh, the focus on the audience in the internet is even bigger than with the traditional mass media. And he also looked at political blogs and he found that usually uh, it's graduates from elite universities or uh, top managers who participate in these fora, people who already in the past could exert a certain political influence. So this is all with a question mark. The third question deals with diversity. At a first glance, we think that everyone can participate. So there should be a lot of um, freedom of opinion. However, on the other hand, we see that there are um, lots of reasons why the um, usage and also the offers are limited. For instance, we see there's a lot of co-orientation. Um, editorials look at one another. Um, they take a look at what matters in different online newspapers. What should they write about today? And in the blogosphere, we hardly ever see new topics, but they deal with topics that, that others have dealt with in the classic media already. Therefore, we do not have as much diversity as we um, would like to have. And last but not least, it also depends on ourselves. The uh, repertoire of the users of internet um, is very limited. You use the same websites all, um, over and over again and do not look for new ones. This also holds true for journalists who usually um, only make use the easy way and do not dig deeper. The next point is the um, power of opinion. Of course, this is not a value, as you will see um, in a few minutes. Generally, in media politics, we think that there's no concentration or should be no concentration of um, the power of opinion. On the internet, however, and this has been expected before, that um, the power is well distributed. However, this is questionable. 
On the one hand, we see that the intermediary aspects, which is a central point of our debate, are vital. They have influence on um, opinion building and do matter. Therefore, they can gain a lot of power. Donald Trump, for instance, has more than 40 million followers. This then is a kind of new persuasion strategy. This was also seen during the last election. We could not really estimate how important these aspects really are. For instance, well-distributed fake news or, um, or block, um, block uh, information and social bots. The next point is about the integration or the erosion of the audience. For democracy, it matters that we focus on the same topics. We need forums in order to discuss political um, issues. The, um, this can be seen in public um, broadcasting and state public broadcasting especially because this is their mandate. However, we now see a certain erosion of the audience. The empirical studies do not underline this um, when it comes to the passive and the active uh, component. The um, passive component states that we only look at what we think is correct. By um, our own choice, we basically act. The other component is the filter bubble, which happens in the background and is protected by algorithms and works automatically. We do not yet have any empirical um, proof for this. These are things that we need to keep observing um, in the long term. We need to um, keep looking at this, but we do not yet have any um, empirical proof. Now I would like to talk about the quality of information. This also is vital. The professional journalism so far made sure that we have a neutral, relevant um, and uh, current information. The professional journalism is in an economic crisis, as we all know. However, we do not have any empirical proof for this either. We cannot prove that there is a um, that there is a um, reduction, a, uh, a loss in quality of this information. However, we also see new innovative approaches, such as um, constructive journalism, um, web. Um, reports and all kinds of new forms of journalism. I think there are quite a few experiments currently. However, media economists say that there will be a major problem because not only the audience distributes elsewhere, but the, um, they do not um, read the professional journalism articles anymore. So this might lead to further losses. Um, citizens, laymen, uh, non-professionals um, are currently filling these gaps and might do so in the future as well. We can, what now, I would now like to talk about the quality of the discourse. There were major expectations to the internet. There was a certain um, utopia that this would be a major forum in which everyone could participate, organized in a democratic way, where citizens could now um, um, agree upon things. Throughout the last years, we have seen the negative aspects. By using the criteria for deliberative quality and rationality um, and coherence, um, we can see that there are certain limits to this. We need to ask ourselves how we can improve the quality of these discourses. Anonymous behavior, no um, social connections, um, the pressure to adapt um, to the existent um, opinion are all aspects of the internet which are not part of a deliberate discourse. Schweiger wrote, it, wrote about this in his book um, about the um, silent citizen. 
There's hardly anything that we can do against populist strategies um, and statements online. These statements are not filtered anymore, which leads to the fact that these persuasion strategies that I talked about can be implemented very well. My last point in this um, area is security or um, um, being um, open to um, being vulnerable. We see certain uh, risks such as cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber espionage and um, other, um, uh, other aspects. State um, interventions um, that are meant to increase security um, oppose, often oppose um, the freedom of the citizens. I might have focused too much on the negative aspects. We said that we wanted to look at the ambivalence of the internet. It's not all only negative, especially due to this um, um, shapeability of the internet. We can try to take a different turn. This is the major challenge that we should uh, face. And this is the last part of my presentation as well. First, I would like to take a step back and talk about a time in which a lot was controlled. People thought that the media could be used in a way to serve the public good. In the 70s and 80s, when the cable and satellite um, um, new technologies were to be introduced, um, politicians thought that these technologies should, should th first be tested in pilot projects in specific cities with a small number of households. Scientists should um, observe these pilot projects and present their results afterwards. Based on these results, the politicians wanted to decide if the citizen should be uh, confronted with this. There were plenty of these cable pilot projects. But it was not possible to um, implement it in this way because um, the new technology was introduced before the studies were presented. So it was an illusion already back then to um, estimate um, what the results would be and to wait for the results. And this holds true even more for the Internet. This is uh, for the Internet. We see that there are um, developments happening which we can hardly control. But now it is up to us to think about how to use better instruments in order to shape the Internet. The first point um, has to do with science. We need to be able to explain what is happening online. We need to develop methods and approaches which allow us, getting back to my uh, field and communication studies, we've had a very uh, simple um, models for the Internet with the mass media and the audience. It was only a one-way street. Um, certain effects could only be seen um, among certain parts of the audience. This could be observed and studies could be um, evaluated. Th this is how we um, calculated and observed effects. However, this cannot be applied to the Internet. There are not simple casualties that we can use for this. I already talked about the return of the mass before. The recipient has become um, a user who communicates themselves. We have long communication chains. When looking at the Internet, this mainly has to do with complex uh, systems, for instance, uh, networking, self-organization, dynamics, nonlinear effects, butterfly effects, for instance. You might know this from um, popular, society, uh, popular literature where these um, phenomena are described. And we can see similar things online. 
We need to start describing them and understanding them by implementing network analyses and trying to understand these chains. There are certain first approaches for this, actually quite an old approach which already considers these different um, aspects. This definitely is a major challenge. We also need to work together with um, experts from the field of informatics who can help us deal with this um, enormous amount of data in order to observe it better and receive better results. However, this is only the first phase. We have started certain research on Twitter because taking a look at the tweets is quite easy. However, we have not yet um, started to observe of the whole online audience. The next question that we ask um, should deal with the tasks that we tackle. It's not about um, a, a, a control by others anymore, but power is distributed differently. Each and everyone who participates in it also um, has a certain responsibility, and especially the intermediaries have received a lot of power. There's no need to talk about uh, the current discussions, for instance, in Germany about the Network Enforcement Act. However, there definitely are different uh, versions of distributing responsibility, which is quite complex. The um, recipients definitely are a major point. And then we need to ask ourselves what measures we can take. I don't think it is our task um, to give certain um, to tell people how to act. This is not what science is meant to do. Many of these measures are difficult to um, foresee. We see nowadays that we need um, more leeway for experiments. The uh, design of a simple block or the control by others are all important aspects, especially uh, journalism must play and plays a vital role. We need to start an information management that um, has not been necessary before the beginning of the Internet. You might know the youth offer of um, certain German um, state public broadcasters which um, offer certain um, a series, certain shows for young people. And they do so in order to simply try new things. This interactive and um, participative um, interaction research um, is important for our goal and in order to design new offers. The term piecemeal engineering states that we cannot um, shape the future as a whole, but only go step by step. We need to change our approaches once we realize that something does not work. Uwe Schiemann wrote a book about the decision society. He said that independence of the complexity of a situation, you can implement a certain rationality. He offers lots of possible solutions in his book. I would now like to end my speech in order to have a sufficient time for our discussion. I do not want to talk about further recipients at this point. So I've tried to give you the um, bigger picture about the um, special characteristics of the Internet. I also tried to describe the current um, state of the Internet and give certain solutions. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Mr. Neuberger, for this um, introduction, for this um, broad overview of your ex field of expertise. I would now like to get back to a few things that you have mentioned and maybe later on ask some more general questions before, as I have already mentioned, you can participate and ask questions either here in the room or on Twitter. Mr. Neuberger, you talked about the uh, presumable, um, the assumptive uh, loss of trust um, happening in the media. The media usually are the biggest uh, critics of media itself. I think I remember a study from England where the radio was uh, considered especially positive, much better than one had thought. So this loss of trust does not really exist. And you said um, the Internet can be shaped by everyone. However, looking at the biggest social network, and we all know what we are talking about, um, and think about what has happened there. For instance, the, the change in the news feed, um, meaning that media is not included in it anymore. Or, as they have said, we will focus on local news because this is um, supposed to encourage people to participate locally. Then one could ask the following. Isn't this controlled by somebody else? It's not shaped by the user, but somebody has a, a monopoly on it and thereby the participation actually decreases. What do you think about this? Well, to talk about this thesis of the loss of trust, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to go more in depth into this. Institutions such as journalism have a comparably um, low level of trust. I remember the figures for journalism quite well. It has been the same for centuries. Trust, the trust in journalism has not been very high. And we now see a major, uh, not a major decrease. It basically remains the same. There are plenty of uh, studies, for instance, the Eurobarometer and also other studies in Germany. One was recently conducted by colleagues in Mainz, which underline an interesting result. On the one hand, they could show that there is a group which is which trusts journalism deeply. However, on the other hand, there's a group which doesn't, and this group increases. So there's a decreasing group of people um, who are somehow in the middle. This study has shown a certain polarization. This might be led back to the discussion itself, because people think about if they should trust journalism or not. This is quite a well-differentiated study. In Germany, we see um, a level as high as never before. The last study from Edelman, this um, um, barometer of trust, shows that Germany, also in comparison to um, other countries, has a quite high tri trust in professional journalism. But the trust in other media, in social networks, is quite low. There's another point that, however, this has been the same in Germany um, before, hasn't it? The skepticism is quite high compared to the United States, for instance. Well, those people do not, those who, people who do not trust journalism anymore, retreat to social media. There's one quite interesting point from a study by Jan Müller. He um, found out, which is quite interesting and counterintuitive actually, because he found out that in authoritarian states, the trust in media tends to be higher than in democratic states. His explanation is the following. In democracies, you have a diversity of media, and, you, and this media is questioned all the time. 
Nobody really knows who to trust anymore. This is exactly the situation in which we as responsible citizens should start to think for ourselves. Therefore, I think a, a maximum amount of trust in media is not necessarily good, because this is the case when all media report the same and nobody differs anymore. They, therefore, we should not only look at um, the um, amount of trust, but also ask other questions. You also talked about securing the quality of the discourse. And I would like to connect this to the complex systems that you mentioned. The easy um, models um, of Habermas and others that you mentioned do not work anymore. We are faced with much more complex systems. So how does it work in these complex systems, systems that are not linear anymore? How can we ensure um, quality of discourse in these systems? How can we regulate this without um, retreating to a top-down model? By reducing the complexity, to answer your question with Lohmann, I think you can make arrangements where this um, proper discourse is being held. Just to give you a rough idea, I think there is no need that at every time everyone may join into the debate, because this causes the problem of a lack of coherency, that people with very different views and motivation uh, discuss very controversially. What we had in the past, and this is the comparison that I'd like to make, is that it is already a huge gain if we have a group of 100 or 150 people who are sort of a representative for the general public and have different views on a particular topic. If you bring these people together, of course, it's a pre-selected group. You have to know them before and let them discuss. In such a setup, uh, the discourse might be really good better because you have also you can have active moderators um, as we know them from the radio and television uh, I know about an analysis of uh, the quality of German media and it talks about the uh, commentaries more than 100 commentaries were looked at but uh, there was not a single contribution by a journalist so the editors the journalists did not join into the debate and I think that's not a good idea and you can also conduct field experiments and look at different arrangements and just wait and see what happens this is what I tried to address when I talked about uh, uh, the joy of experimenting. Of course, that is also an issue of resources. Uh, not everybody, not every agency or organization is in the position to um, give people the time and the resources to do that. And But that is may, uh, maybe one of the tasks uh, that I referred to. Well, if I look at Deutschlandfunk Radio, for example, uh, that is something that is uh, moderated in a very different way than Spiegel Online is presented, uh, where people are warned, uh, stay out of this, um, do not uh, interfere any longer, the crowd will do the rest. So do not interfere, do not get involved. Well, I think the uh, understanding of a journalist's role also will have to change because they need to uh, begin to interact with their audience once they have finished their article um, this is not the end of it they need to engage in a conversation with their readership or their audience that is the future and it, this is will also be an important um, connecting link to the audience I think this top-down approach this uh, uh, journalism from the front we tell you how you need to to understand the world is not a very helpful approach. So journalism will need to change. It's also very time consuming. As a free journalist, I uh, can not really do this. I can only do this as uh, an employed journalist. You referred to this group of 100 to 200 people who 
could be a representative audience? How will you bring these people together? What kind of regulating mechanisms can we use? Would they be uh, serve as a kind of a gatekeeper that you didn't mention before? Well, of course, we would need to optimize the framework conditions. If you look at Habermas and his criteria for deliberations, a number of criteria uh, that also uh, contradict themselves. There is a contradiction between the openness to everybody. Everybody can join in and that every opinion can be uttered at any time. Um, and this contradicts certain uh, timings for uh, the discourse, uh, uh, rationality is an important aspect, uh, uh, that you listen to other lines of reasoning and that you qualify your own judgment. Um, there is always a certain tension that is not easily dissolved. Um, there are two extremes and we have the gate in between that allows everybody to join into the debate and then maybe we can have the commentaries as on the internet, uh, that is one approach, or we say, well, there is uh, only journalists can comment on that. But I think we need to experiment more with these. One experiment could be that we select a group of people um, not completely at random, uh, should be specialized people, they should have an interest, they should be representative. In the US, for example, we have deliberative polls. That was even in the times before the internet. People uh, were asked as a responsible citizens, they were taken seriously. Uh, we really, They really wanted to know what they think. And uh, that was a good experiment to see how people discuss with each other. Well, deliberation is an important um, notion with Habermas. I'm not a communication science, but I think the main difference is between Gorth and Habermas. Uh, Habermas says deliberation is something where you do not necessarily need institutional players. Worth uh, has a different view. And I think this is still the crux. So what is an institution? What is a, a non-institutional player? So how can you provide the necessary diversity in this sort of excerpt? Is this old-fashioned for the discussion that we uh, have today? I do not really see the contradiction between Habermas and what you have just proposed. Well, I tried to argue with Habermas and to follow his line of reasoning. Um, his ideal notion is a bottom-up development. The starting point should be not organized citizens, uh, then uh, civil society representatives, uh, all the way up to the political parties who uh, are then to take up certain topics and discuss them in parliament. So he has a sort of a chain of different levels and he argues that we need to start with this informal sector. And the question is, how can you implement that on the internet? We do not really have a, a full view of the internet audience. We do not really know who that is. Uh, we sometimes have small groups, sometimes we have a big audience. and. Sometimes we have a situation where uh, the mass media are also dominating the internet and uh, their uh, sort of influence trickles down to the bottom. Habermas was relatively um, optimistic. He thought that we could make it happen. What happens in the small social blogs uh, with the participation of the citizens could be uh, raised to higher levels step by step and make the whole process process more permeable. That was the ideal view of it. Well, how can this work in practice? 
I think this is a mediation role for professional journalists. They have to draw people's attention to discussions on the internet, but it is also a call for other people who are somewhere in between so that this approach from the bottom to the top actually works. I think many people are worried about the echo chambers and the filter bubbles that you briefly touched upon. Uh, you said that from a scientific point of view, there was no real evidence for that. Uh, you said uh, we keep looking for them, but we cannot find them in empirical studies. Why do we feel uh, that uh, the filter bubbles uh, promote the disintegration? Why do we have this feeling that they have such a strong impact, yet you cannot find them? Can you explain this effect? Why do we believe in them? Well, in the political arena, we usually reason with uh, certain theses and, uh, well, the term echo chamber comes up. I didn't want to reject them all. There is this principle that uh, usually like-minded people tend to clock together. But they are not completely separate from the rest of the world. So I would only want to qualify this isolationist tendencies. It's not really a bad thing if people stay within their own group. Uh, if this were the case, we wouldn't have these hate comments, uh, these explosions of hate somewhere on the internet. Uh, they only happen because people leave their filter bubble. And of course, there's a lot of criticism in the media, and they have uh, a lot of prejudices prejudice vis-à-vis -vis the media. Maybe we should again look uh, at the past. Uh, echo chambers were there before. It was uh, people sitting around a table in a pub um, uh, sharing the same opinion and agreeing with each other. And this is something that is only transferred onto the internet. Maybe it's just things that we didn't see as such in the past. When we talk about the hate speeches, uh, we come to responsibilities. Uh, we talked about the Network Enforcement Act very briefly. Well, we have here a lecture series that also wants to look at a European perspective of uh, the topics that we are discussing. And when it comes to the Network Enforcement Act, uh, uh, this is a German act that is much stricter at a German level than what is called for at European level. Our Justice Minister was very um, firm on that. Uh, at the European level, um, the policy is much more liberal. Well, what do you think? I think I said it at the beginning, at the end of my talk, it's something that we simply need to test and try. Um, the Network Enforcement Act, uh, we could see that at the end of last year, how this can be instrumentalized by um, politicians. So that needs to be discussed. What we need is transparency. We need to understand the filters and the criteria used. And we need to be able to adjust and to a question the decisions. So on the one hand, we want to do something against these hate comments, and the intermediaries indeed need to be held accountable. But on the other hand, when we talk about censorship, we mustn't overdo it. And we must also be aware of the possibility of political instrumentalization of this whole process. So so this is an open-ended process. We do not really know where we are going. Uh, we need to test it experimentally. That means to be able to adjust them quickly if necessary and not wait for the political process.
process that may be a rather lengthy one. Well, I'd like to uh, open the discussion to the audience. Uh, we have two microphones, and Mrs. Werner will observe our Twitter feeds. So here in uh, row two, we have uh, a gentleman who would like to take the microphone. Well, thank you very much. A very inspiring and exciting talk. You talked a lot about the public sphere, about audiences, and in doing so, you talked about democracy. Well, the topic is democracy and public sphere, but I'd like to focus on democracy now. Do you think uh, there are peculiarities and uh, ruptures uh, when it comes to the democratic process in connection with the Internet? Or which problems do you see as a result of the Internet use by different people? And which options do we have to use the tools to improve democratic processes? Well, I think one aspect I uh, touched upon in rather detail, that is how um, uh, public sphere goes hand in hand with democracy. Democracy is not just about uh, finding a majority, but it's also about forming an opinion. Uh, citizens are to uh, understand the pros and cons of issues, and I think this is something that we discussed at length. So this is about how the Internet touches upon transparency and democracy. Another point, this is something that you could also do on the Internet in terms of e-voting, for example, and of course you can also look at the political institutions and ask which changes could uh, occur there. Uh, for example, more transparency of parliamentary discussions. I think the Internet Commission was uh, uh, quite a role model here by um, making public all their documents. Um, it's uh, important that even in the later phases of the political discussion, which usually take place behind closed doors, uh, to have some sort of access to information and help uh, continue to shape or form the opinion of the people. I'd like to focus on the positive aspects first. Then, of course, there are open data where you can gain um, better insight into administrative work. Uh, again, there are a lot of options for more transparency and to take the responsible citizen more seriously. This is maybe just to add to what I said before. I have seen more hands raised, but of course I didn't spot them. Well, where are we? I think I saw a lady in row five. Und dann gleich dahinter noch mal und danach würde ich gerne mal and then immediately behind her. Um, das Thema ist ja Demokratie und Öffentlichkeit in der well, digitalen the Gesellschaft. Well, topic is democracy and the public sphere in the digital society. I recently attended an event. Uh, I did not control it myself, but it was about fake news, and a professor said that the uh, 20 untrue uh, statements were much more liked before the U.S. presidential election than uh, the 20 true statements. So more people must have shared and liked uh, the untrue comments. So this must have an impact on our societies. And I have another question because I also feel that I myself am in a filter bubble. I mean, isn't Google sort of almighty because it really controls what we do? All our requests are, all our searches are stored and the algorithms are applied uh, and the way information is displayed, that is something that you can actually purchase. I know my question is uh, somewhat um, confused, but uh, I hope you 
can sort it out. Well, yes, first, uh, on Google, you can buy advertisements, but uh, uh, there is a certain control in Germany and has been for the last 15 years. Uh, that's the voluntary self-control, how to um, indicate exactly that something is an advert uh, in order not to be confused by the consumer. Also with a view to Google, the question of the personalization, um, there are tests where different people searched for the same terms and came up with different results. My colleague Birgit Stark in Mainz um, did, uh, placed 100,000 requests with Google together with her team and depending on the search, usual search behavior, people came to different results. So this is the empirical uh, answer that we have, but it's difficult to actually prove the filter bubble effect. But of course you are correct in stating that a lot of data is collected and stored and we do not exactly know what Google does with these data, whether they are doing field experiments or um, whether they are already controlling us with the data. Um, there are some studies on Facebook already, so we have some insight into that, for example, that you can actually control moods depending on whether you provide more positive or more negative news feed. And, uh, that has an impact on the uh, follow-on uh, comments by the people. Another study was on the I voted button. So you could signal to your friends that you did vote and sort of inspire them to vote as well. So this may be a tool to influence possibly election results. Uh, there is a similar study on a Google search in a lab experiment. There is indeed the, pos the possibility to manipulate uh, something if people search for uh, candidates for an election and depending on whether you post positive or negative statements first, this can have an influence on how the people vote. We as academic researchers have uh, not enough influence. We do not have any insight into uh, the data that Google collects. We do not know what they do with the data and we do not know which research they themselves conduct. They do have uh, quite a lot of experts dealing with it, but we do not know a lot about it. We have a couple of more questions in the audience. Albert Reinhardt, I have been following this discussion for quite some time. I think we as a society, as representatives of a culture, uh, seem uh, not to see is to learn about social phenomena. Uh, so far, we always thought that we need to adapt to developments, but now we are faced with a new situation. The older generation is somewhat lost. They don't know which way to go. Uh, so it's not just uh, uh, learning and storing the information, but now you have a new approach to learning, open learning, we call it. Uh, the algorithms are already being optimized, so the question is, uh, why shouldn't young people, that would be the elite, uh, uh, according to Luhmann, uh, the elite of the young people, uh, who are uh, sufficiently different from the existing society if they, as an age group, uh, would engage at different political level, at uh, local level, regional level, etc. If they were to provide uh, motions or bills for political decisions, it is about political interaction 
political involvement. Um, and that is something that we do not see in many schools these days. So, but without knowing the system and being familiar with the system, um, I easily feel left behind. And if I am not taught to work with the system at school, then um, people do not grow up to be responsible citizens. I think it was quite reasonable what you said. Uh, I am not an educational scientist, uh, so I do not really know how learning democracy can be done at school. But I think the Internet offers opportunities to get to know political processes in a playful way and to start at a very early age, maybe in a, uh, a game situation, so that young people learn more about democracy early on. But that is not my field of expertise. Let's have a look at Twitter and our tweets. Mrs. Werner, you need a microphone. All those who joined us with through the live stream also should be heard. Everybody? No, we have uh, selected questions. A question of principle, Mr. Neuberger. Can you actually talk about the Internet as a medium? Can we distinguish online and offline world? Well, one of my favorite questions, is it indeed a medium? There are different views on that. I think this debate is rather irrelevant. I said it in my talk, you can discuss technological and institutional media. Some people may say it is a technological platform, but what is actually, uh, what it is transformed into and what it is used for is so heterogeneous that you, uh, basically the internet is a variety of individual different media. We have the field of professional journalism on the internet, we have social media, etc. Uh, the internet uh, usually uh, only describes what is its present object of research and probably you would have to come up with a model of a layered model. The second question, can, can we distinguish the offline and online world? Well, I think this again is a simplification that we can no longer use. Uh, we see these two worlds merging and uh, also, in the past, people never used the terms correctly. Online means that there is a constant connection between a sender and receiver. Um, so basically, radio and TV were also online media, whereas a newspaper would have been regarded as an offline media. Uh, today, people use offline media to discuss everything that is not the Internet. There's another question. What incentives can we make so that social media um, offers change their behavior? Because often this is um, they have a certain business model. How can we monetize forums? How can we find somebody who is the moderator and ensures um, high-level discussions? Are business models possible? I doubt it. Uh, I think there are very few examples where people paid in order to um, participate in a discussion. I think this is problematic because it um, in enables and um, enables certain limitations. Only uh, specific citizens can participate in these models. But this is um, in contrast to journalistic articles. Usually there was a newspaper edition which could be bought by the citizen and who then received a final journalistic product. He was willing to pay for it. But what about a discussion that um, goes on and on for weeks and months? Therefore, I think that we 
should think about other ways of financing. I talked about this when talking about the public broadcasting, where this is a major task as well. I think these forums should be um, moderated independently. This should not be the task of parties or of other political institutions. I think it's good to have independent operators of these platforms. And there's another question from Ute. Your descriptions dealt with the culture sphere here and its institutions. What um, perspective for studies would you have thinking broader? Well, international um, comparisons are restricted to, are limited to Europe, Northern America, parts of Asia and other continents are hardly ever considered. This is indeed a deficit. In our, at our institute in Munich, we have an international um, survey words of journalism. Hanisch has um, developed the um, biggest network, I think, with 80 countries involved. They all received the, the same questions um, and and therefore, this um, survey allowed to interview journalists um, everywhere in the world. This is what we've seen for journalism, and it might create better results. Of course, one might assume that in certain cultural areas and also language um, areas, the um, answers are um, restricted to to a certain field. However, there are different um, levels of um, outreach. The United States are often at the forefront when it comes to using social media. Germany is um, rather left behind. The, um, there are um, surveys in 36 uh, countries by the Reuters Institute, and this is quite um, interesting looking at their results. However, in Northern uh, America and Europe, in Southern America and Asian countries, we see that they also participate in these surveys, and this gives us a um, better insight into what's happening. I would like to allow another question from the room before going back to Twitter quickly. We have around 12 minutes left before um, our time is up. I will need three minutes at the end in order to uh, summarize a bit and end our discussion. So please, one question from the room. Alexander Spees from the Pirates Party. I have one quick question. You talked about the filter bubbles. I think the Internet gives us the opportunity to um, inform yourself about um, opposite opinions. You're not only in the print filter bubble, you can also click elsewhere and find out more. Have you um, done research on how often this happens? This is basically the counter thesis. We do not retreat into the um, echo chamber and only discuss with uh, like-minded people and support one another. Yes, there are surveys about this. There's a new study by Fletcher and Nielsen. They worked with the um, data from the Reuters Institute. This data was based on Google. Um, there are other Facebook studies which state that Facebook does confront us with um, topics that we did not look for. It's called serendipity effect. And it also depends on how you use the Internet. The Internet can provide a certain surprise effect for us because we keep um, finding out about things that we were not looking for. Therefore, I tried to quantify this aspect. I think we also need to differentiate better in surveys. We need to differentiate between groups, take into account the socio-demographic um, background, the um, behavior and attitudes. We can't generalize here. There are surveys, surveys describing what you just said. Is there another question in the room? Yes. Thank you very much for this interesting lecture. I have one 
very quick question. Does the digital society produce new inclusion or exclusion models? Or are the existing models reproduced? And one can, what can the comparative media research contribute to not only keep this aspect as um, abstract, but also take a look at individual media and state that the all-inclusive approach of the Internet um, does not hold true? That is what would interest me with respect to the socio-demographic background and not only the political perspective of digital divide, which is not empirical enough. Well, the research on digital divide is quite differentiated already. The question of political participation was something that I um, talked about as well. However, since the Internet does offer something on every topic and gives us opportunity for every um, way of living, we must um, ask these questions. Everyone can find, for instance, a, a cheap uh, journey online. These are also aspects that concern equality and inequality. How do we use this medium? I'm afraid I'm not, um, I do not know the majority of the surveys. The inclusion and exclusion models are reproduced, definitely. Socio-demographic background does count. And what also counts is the differentiated behavior and attitude towards Internet. In the field of political participation, we see that young people, independent from their level of education, are um, very much involved. Their um, educational background does not have much of an influence. So all in all, I think we could say, considering especially one study in Germany about the political participation from Emma Fulle Wolling, who um, did very profound research on this, and they state that lots of things are reproduced and there's only a minor group of um, participating active people because the Internet does not allow everyone to participate actively all of a sudden. That's not the case. I would like to allow one last question from Twitter before I have uh, the last two and um, summarize our lecture. The media does play a role here because it um, only allows short questions. One user would like to know what potential would an Internet ID have in order to um, limit um, anti-democratic statements? I'm rather skeptical. As far as I'm concerned, I think this means that you don't act anonymously, that you must declare who you are, you must show your identity before you can contribute. Generally, it's good to show who you are when um, acting online. This does increase, increase responsibility. So you do not simply have the opportunity of leaving a certain situation without any consequences. However, I do not want to go too much into detail. We know situations where it can be negative to show your own name because you can be identified. For instance, in authoritarian states where you are threatened when declaring who you are. Or sometimes it's enough to show, um, to, to show your status. So, no, that is not a solution for me. There's another question from Facebook. What's the new role of um, 
for free search against the background of um, alternative facts and fake news. Well, this answer could take two hours. Last Friday, I was at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. There was a working party which dealt with this question, with the new digital um, relations between um, uh, public and democracy. Of course, they tried to analyze the problems first, the attacks against research, which make us assume that there is a loss of trust. There are alternative truths, conspiracy theories and others online. These are probably defensive reactions. On the other hand, we should not forget the opportunities, both for research itself, because there are new forms of publishing, of discussing, which increase quality and um, lead to more transparency. This is also a way of um, having citizens participate more in politics. But this also influences the relations between um, science and the broader public. At this point, I would like to underline the positive aspects. We have the opportunity to um, allow citizens to inform themselves better. For instance, they um, read a certain paper before going to the doctor and misunderstand something, but they can inform themselves better. And there are also moral questions that are closely connected to a lot of topics. These questions can then be discussed in with a broader audience and um, together with citizens. I have two quick questions. Maybe you can answer them as quickly as possible. This is a question regarding the future. We always try to think about the power of a decision of the individual. We talked about the um, joy of um, trying experiments of lawmakers, for instance, when it comes to comments of journalism and users, or when it comes to new um, audiences, which are only part audiences. All this was described quite um, in detail. How do you do it? Do you comment on things? Do you participate? Yes. This is quite a um, complex question for me. There are colleagues of mine who do so quite intensively. I um, helped a um, graduate work a, on a PhD thesis, which dealt with the presence on Facebook and Twitter and ResearchGate, for instance. In these social networks, it's not only um, about underlining your publication, but also about networking. I would like to underline that, yes, this is important, and young people seem to think that this matters for their career, but this also includes certain problems. You think you create social capital by networking and connecting to others and also being present 24-7. Um, this is supposed or considered to have a very positive influence on the final result. I understood that well, you yourself try to stay back a bit, but the young people shouldn't. There's one last question that I would like to ask. You quoted Castells, the first lecture that we had. It's not the medium forming the message, but vice versa. Many people, ordinary people, um, do not necessarily or sometimes do suffer from hate speech. Not only public people do. So Facebook has uh, influence on them as well. I would say the step from text to link to video does play a certain role. The video can have a more direct um, connection and effect. It can also increase the potential um, of, uh, of feeling connected and of addiction. 
all the things that you propose, these experiments for shaping the audience new, can they be implemented in a monopolistic um, society? You mentioned two aspects. On the one hand, the role of effects and in what way they are supported by visualization. On Twitter, you only have 140, um, oh, now it's 280 um, letters that you can use. So this leads to a certain um, pointedness. These platforms therefore um, support very emotional, also aggressive messages because they uh, generate more clicks. Economically speaking, this can be um, beneficial. This is exactly the risk that we see these days. We um, are um, confronted with these media. We did some surveys on in what way public broadcast and journalism use these activities um, and confront themselves with this limit. Well, 40% less traffic is what we have already mentioned. Yes, this is what we talked about, but also regarding the consequences. These uh, social media um, decide upon the restrictions and limits. This is how you reach young people. This is how you reach the citizens. For instance, thinking about the amount of money that was invested in a European search engine. I think there are reasons for why this, this is not happening, but we should be careful. Not everything should be done on these platforms. When it comes to the future, uh, algorithms and um, artificial intelligence, um, we will hear a discourse by Elena Esposito from Bielefeld. She will talk about um, the theory of systems and the future of algorithms. This is something that we talked about in brief um, at this lecture as well. Before ending this lecture, I would like to give you a little gift. It's a black box, maybe a grey box rather. Um, and I would like to give this to you and thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. Christoph Neuberger, thank you very much.